Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I would like to take a moment and say welcome and thank you for being here. If you would like to know more of what's going on here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning more about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways, whether you visit our physical location, give online, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Amen. Go to Psalms this morning, chapter 143, or the 143rd Psalm. Uh, many of you saw on Facebook that I posted last night. I don't do that very often, but um, I'm going to deal with some things this morning that are really difficult to deal with, and I want to do it with your support. Um, it's, it, I went through my notes, and nowadays on your computer, it will check every word. So I can scan through all the messages I've preached in the last probably 15 years, and I can just do a keyword search. So I searched for depression. And during 2018, 2019, I preached entire messages, or at least parts of messages, I counted seven times in those two years. Nothing in 2020 that specifically popped up that word which didn't surprise me. It was almost as if the Lord was getting us ready. Now, I know you don't catalog my messages, and I, you and I, neither one, probably remember what I said last week or maybe even 15 minutes ago, right? But um, I just wanted to check and see how often we talked about this, but we're going to go a little further today than, than I've done before, and I want to I want to lay a foundation here or build on a foundation, whatever the case may be. Let's look at verse 1. Psalm 143, verse 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my plea. Answer me because you are faithful and righteous. Now I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Many of you have that. Some of you, though, may have the New King James or some other, uh, the NIV perhaps. But it will be very similar. Don't put your servant on trial for no one is innocent before you. My enemy has chased me. He has knocked me to the ground and forces me to live in darkness like those in the grave. I want to talk to you today about moving from your darkness to your destiny. Now, I chose that topic because uh, it's not normal for me. I would never, <laughs> I would never choose this, that kind of terminology unless I wanted to highlight something. Lots and lots of people a few people in our nation who are uh, what some would describe as Christian celebrities, although there is no such thing, but they're very famous Christians and they write lots of books and are seen a lot and oftentimes use those kinds of words, moving into your destiny, moving, I'm going to tell you something, when you got saved, you found your destiny and his name is Jesus, Amen. And in America, we often slant things to mean in between the lines. We don't say it, but in between the lines, you're going to have success. You're going to be prosperous. Everything's going to be marvelous, fantastic. And, and, and that's going to be God's sign that he's with you. But then when it happens for them but not us, we think there's something wrong with us. Right? Right? And the truth is, is that God never promises success and prosperity and blessing without also promising, listen, you're going to go through things that you weren't expecting. You're going to have things happen that you can't control. And if you don't believe me today, the Lord will say, you just stay with me until you're in your 70s or 80s. And then I'll help convince you that you're not in control. Hello? Listen, I've watched a lot of people. For 35 years, I watched people that had faith, like they could move mountains at the drop of a hat. They could make anything happen until they couldn't. And listen, I don't base that on my observation. Jesus looked at his own disciples. So I'm going to tell you something. I've watched you for the last three and a half years. You're young. You're strong. You can do almost anything. And I said, let's walk on water. You jumped over the boat, and out you came. But there's a day coming when you're going to be bound by others. You're going to be taking places you don't want to go. And they're going to do things to you you did not want to have happen. That's my plan for you. How many of you would have said right then, um, you know, they're starting another faith down the road. It's a different religion, but it feels pretty good. I think, I, I think I'm going to go that way. 
we find out some things in this text that are challenging to us. In verse 2, he says, Don't put your servant on trial, for no one is innocent before you. Listen, thank God for the blood. We're only innocent because of the blood. Amen? Verse 3, my enemy has chased me. I don't know what your enemy is. It could be an addiction. It could be depression. It could be what you've been through in the past. It could be any one of a number of things. But the darkness, David says, makes me feel like I'm in the grave. Now, he had not been in the grave, so obviously this is symbolic. It's a darkness that seems deadly. It's a darkness that takes over everything, a personality. And it's a darkness that takes over your processing, thinking, experiencing. And in that darkness, David is crying out to God, I'm overwhelmed. Don't you love that the Psalms are in the Bible? Don't you love that David, who the first time we meet him, he's killing a giant, and then for the rest of his ministry to us, it's all about, you wouldn't believe how overwhelmed I felt. I was constantly struggling. I always wondered if God was even going to bring me out. Half the time I was running for my life, and even when I became king, I was never certain that I wasn't going to fall the next day. And He captures all of that and shares it with us. That's the love of our God. Amen. Well, this week, uh, I don't remember which day, and it could have been, actually, I think it was the end of last week, and this news report doesn't have what I quoted or captured. I didn't get the date on it. You guys can put it up there. Maybe it's on this picture. Um, This is from the San Diego Union Tribune paper, and it's dated August 16th of 21. Death of pastor's wife stirs up world's generosity and questions on faith and mental health. This is in, of course, California, Bonsall, California. The tragic death of a North County pastor's wife last month has launched a rare community dialogue on faith and suicide. Hmm. It has brought out the giving spirit in people from all over the world, which is beautiful. I'm not, that's not the part we're going to focus on. I'm not going to read the whole article, but I put that up there so that you can reference it. If you want to look it up on your own time, you can. It's written by a lady by the name of Pam Cragen, although it's in California, so the name Pam may or may not mean a woman. On July 31, Bonsall resident Paige Hilkin, 28, took her own life while while undergoing treatment at a mental health clinic in Arizona. She died just four months after giving birth to her fifth child with husband Christopher Hilkin, a teaching pastor and young young adult minister for North Coast Church in Vista, California. Before her death, Paige ran several online businesses promoting holistic health, dietary supplement, and home care products, as well as an Instagram page she used for ministry and personal updates with nearly 18,000 followers. In the weeks and months leading up to her death, she published several videos and written posts on Instagram about her health struggle. On April 8th, she posted a photo of herself in the hospital and wrote that after the March birth of her daughter, Finley, she was diagnosed with a blood clot in her right lung. A few weeks later, she posted a video describing her battle with anxiety and depression and the tools she was using to cope with these issues. Faith, homeopathic and nutritional supplements, probiotics, probiotics, biotics, and books. Then just three weeks before she died, she posted a follow-up Instagram video saying her anxiety had had turned into severe insomnia and that her brain was stuck in a state of PTSD and I was afraid of everything. Quote, my brain was stuck in a state of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I was afraid of everything. After she died, and with her husband's blessing, North Coast Church openly shared information about her death to help reduce the stigma often associated with suicide and to share modern biblical teachings on the subject. It's, it's always dangerous to speak about this kind of a situation. And there are those of you here, some of you I know, others, if this is you, I may not know, but you've had in your family, your extended family, someone who took their life. Uh, maybe you had someone who passed away of a drug overdose, and that's you know, on what they call an accidental overdose, and that can be very close to that because they're kind of you know, walking on that fine line between life and death. I want to be careful because I don't want you to in any way interpret anything I'm going to say as derogatory towards this church, towards the family, or towards her. How heartbreaking that five children now are without a mother. 
And these kids are seven and under. Just kind of overwhelming. Uh, Sister Pam and I know a little bit of this church. The lead pastor, this, her husband was not the lead pastor. This is a big church, thousands of people. But her husband spoke at the Assemblies of God ministers retreat four or five years ago. I forget which it was, here in our district, in the Potomac District. And the pastor is uh, Pastor Larry Osborne. So the church wanted to, what was that? They uh, shared information about her death to help reduce the stigma often associated with suicide and to share modern biblical teachings on the subject. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that's this woman's take on it because there are no ancient as opposed to modern teachings biblically. There just there aren't. Thank God that every generation has access to his word and the illumination of the Holy Spirit if we seek it. But we're not getting information from the Bible that wasn't available 2,000 years ago. I'm sorry. That just, that's not the case. One San Diego County expert on mental health praised Paige Hilkin and the church's openness in addressing mental health and the subject of suicide openly saying it could encourage many people to seek treatment and reduce the stigma associated with suicide. When faith leaders, this is her, when faith leaders, quote, when faith leaders embrace this, it helps alleviate the sense of guilt people feel and it brings relief to families, says Catherine Nicario, I may be pronouncing that right or wrong, CEO of the National Alliance on Mental Illness for San Diego and Imperial Counties. This happens in many families, she said, so if we can be accepting and supportive, it acknowledges that mental conditions do exist. I agree. Nicario with NAMI San Diego said it's very common for adults to experience anxiety and depression for the first time in their 20s because they're triggered by new stressors they haven't encountered before, such as moving away from their home and losing that support system. Some of you had parents, fathers, grandfathers who encountered stressors and were triggered when they were put on ships and sent half a world away to fight a war on behalf of all the nations of the world. But many adults don't seek treatment quickly enough because they don't recognize its seriousness for or fear the stigma associated with it. She said some megachurches use terminology that people with mental health conditions are broken, but that, terminology is never, but that terminology is never used to describe people with cancer or other illnesses. Okay. So let's, since the news person didn't do this, let's slow down here a minute, and let's take some time and say, no, I'm sorry, you're wrong. If you fall and you hear a crack and you go to the hospital, they might say, your arm is broken. Right? Your body is broken. You might go to the doctor and they say your immune system is compromised. Or they could use the word your immune system is broken. So, yes, as a matter of fact, they do use terminology of bodies that are broken and they use the word broken. That's why they use the word, because something's broken. Now, I have a follow-up question. Some mega churches teach, they have a theology that teaches... I want to read it to you again. Some, she said, some megachurches use terminology that people with mental health conditions, and I, I'm sorry, but I don't think this is a, a mental health condition. I think it's a mental unhealthy condition. We're trying to get them healthy, aren't we? I, I struggle with how they flow through their term. They, people yell at us in the church, oh, you got words nobody understands. You use a language. you got to change your language because the world doesn't understand. We've been hearing that for 20 years. You can't use all that church lingo. Well, if you're going to start attending church, you're going to use church lingo. Right? Is there a stigma? There's a stigma with lots of stuff. If you didn't wear the right shoes in school, there was a stigma. If you used the wrong words and spoke funny, there was a stigma. If you moved here from some other place, there's a stigma, right? I'm sorry. That's part of the world. There are stigmas. But this idea that some Mega churches use terminology that people with mental health conditions are broken. I've never heard that in any church. Maybe, maybe you have and you can enlighten me, but I've never heard that. And I don't understand how somebody who's a professional outside of the church world can assign certain theological truisms about the world in which they're not a professional. 
Yeah, it gets me frustrated. Here she goes. Can prayer provide comfort and faith to a community? Absolutely. But you cannot pray away a mental health concern, she said. We've worked with faith leaders in training them to ask open-ended questions and know where there are resources to guide people to get treatment services. It is so vitally important the faith community embraces this in a positive manner. Do you know where she was when she took her life? At a residential mental health treatment facility in Arizona. So you tell me, Mrs. Mental Health Expert, how that was the right outcome. I don't have all the answers. I don't. And you can go through something and it'll shake your faith to its foundation. But to tell us that prayer and faith are limited in what they can impact, that might be your experience in the religious dead places you go, but that is not the experience of God's people. That is not what God called us to. That is not what Jesus Christ died for. Does it mean we get the miracle healing every time we ask? No. Miracle healings are rare. They're the minority. We, we don't see them nearly as much as we'd like to, but when we see them, we know them. And you can have the same kind of a healing experience in your mental health situation. Now, let me tell you something. If you become... You're in a situation where you begin to be overwhelmed and you have insomnia, you can't sleep for a couple of days, and you're hallucinating, I'm going to tell you, you should have already been to your doctor and said to your doctor, I cannot sleep. Explain everything. This thing of, well, no, I didn't tell him that because it really doesn't matter. No, I, listen, Jesus tells us to be honest. Lying to your doctor is not following Jesus. And let them give you medicine. Because not sleeping is bad for your body. It's worse for your mind. And there are medicines out there. Now, I appreciate all the probiotics and homeopathies and all this stuff. It's fantastic. Glory to God. And I know there are people now who won't take medicine because Big Pharma makes all this money. And I always want to say, well, what do you think you're doing buying all that? Somebody in Big, big Probiotic is making a ton of money, Right? Check them out. Go read that label. Go on the internet and find out who owns that company and how much they're worth. Man, if I was today going to enter into either making medicines to help the world's health or making things that are just nutritional supplements, I'd go the nutritional way because nobody's criticizing me. I don't know what the treatment center doesn't name it in Arizona. Maybe it didn't offer medicines in the, in the sense that we think of them. Maybe it was only treatment-based, and, and by that I mean just simple uh, talking therapies and maybe more supplements. She had all of the things I mentioned business-wise. She was the famous person to 18,000 people. I'm going to tell you something. Not everybody can handle what it is to feel responsible for 1,800 people, let alone 18,000. And that's part of the junk with the social media is that people just want to gather more and more and more followers, and then they turn around and realize, uh-oh, these people are following me. She also had five children and was homeschooling them. Where were the people... So you're going to hear this from me today. I've been hinting at it. I've been pushing a couple of you. And you're going to hear me say it again. You can think you can do it all, but you cannot. Something or somebody will break, and when it does, it will break horrifically. You'll be shattered into a thousand pieces, and you won't know where to start to pick them up because you cannot do and be everything, man or woman. Slow down if you're going too fast. If you're not going fast enough, speed up. Well, how do I know, Pastor? I don't know. That's why we run to Jesus, right? He can tell you. But this troubles me because I know you remember last year I brought a young couple in and uh, they were uh, interested in our position for youth leadership here and they had this, this kind of an approach to mental unhealth. And, um, 
I, as we, Pastor Am and I, interviewed them later in the week by video, and at one point I said, listen, I'm sorry. What you're preaching is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a gospel, but it's not the gospel. If you get overwhelmed, get with your doctor. I always say that. Get where you need to be. There are medicines that can help. We are blessed in our nation to have access to wonderful things. If you don't want to take them, then you need to understand <laughs> there, there may be some things that you face. Well, pastor, I just feel, I feel God doesn't want me to. Okay, then I respect, I absolutely respect your conviction. And I'll live by that. But please be careful. I'm not going to preach my conviction to you, and I don't want you to preach your conviction to others. They're convictions. If you think you can encourage somebody, absolutely. But this, um, the, you, you got to read the article. And the contradictions are overwhelming. Her and her husband felt like they had to be transparent so that that, that generation be, would be able to accept them. And it was her goal to just help people in their faith to know that Jesus could take them through whatever. Well, that's not the outcome we got. That's what breaks my heart. I, uh, all right, let's look at this. As America becomes secular, there's no longer any confidence in faith, faith leaders, or faith's results. Soul in the Greek, as I've told you about 10 million times, is suki, P-S-U-C-H-E. <clears throat> in English, it's P-S-Y-C-H-E, psyche. And so the Bible, I don't care what the professional health, mental, unhealth people have to say. And you need to understand, some of them, I, I could use the word many, I won't, because they could say that about pastors. But some of them are in the field that they're in because they're trying to figure out their own psyche. Not all. And some of them are there because they really want to be helpful, and some of them are. I think of the guy I quoted there two or three years ago from over at, at uh, Hopkins, and he's a retired child uh, specialist psychologist and medical doctor and all that, and he's just written all kinds of stuff about this gender-changing thing, and, and they've just rejected him. So the medical, excuse me, the mental unhealth community doesn't accept everybody who's amongst them. They only accept those who are theologically aligned with them. So let me ask you, if the Bible speaks about the soul or the psyche hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, am I not a mental health expert just as the one who works in the field of psychology or psychiatry? And I don't know what your answer to that would be. And are there those pastors who feel like they should not go into those areas, they don't want to talk to people about that, they're not qualified? Absolutely. And I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't have answers to most of our problems. Uh, I wish I did. There's no single message, no single altar call or experience that will provide everything you and I need, but neither will any single therapist or treatment or medicine. We're more complex than that, and thank God for it. Amen? So our goal is to seek, we're seeking, that we can grow in our knowledge of God and also in understanding our body, how our body operates, our psyche, and what it's doing. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between body and soul. All right, now let's go to um, verse 4. I'm losing all hope. I'm paralyzed with fear. I remember the days of old. I ponder all your great works and think about what you have done. I lift my hands to you in prayer. I thirst for you as parched land thirsts for rain. Number one, if you want to move from darkness to destiny, I want you to know today that losing hope is not losing the battle. Losing hope is not the same thing as losing the battle. In the middle of everything you're going through, you can lose hope, not just once, but a dozen times. You might lose hope so many times you don't know where to turn or how to even spell the word hope. 
And that's okay. David says again and again what he's going through, and he describes it that way in verse 4. I am losing all hope. As a matter of fact, I've become paralyzed with fear. That's exactly what she described of herself. She said, I have daily PT. I'm, I'm just overwhelmed with PTSD moment by moment. I think some ladies might have been, I don't know, but ladies here. I'm not asking you to bring correction to anybody in the church or to speak disparagingly or condescendingly, but you can hug your sister occasionally, maybe somebody, although it's unusual for folks to have four or five kids nowadays, but you would hug that lady after child three and say, listen, you need to understand that it's quite likely that you're going to hit postpartum. I've never had it. I've never had partum, let alone postpartum. And thank God for it. Amen? I don't know if you ladies think of it as as a blessing or a burden. I don't know if you blame Adam and Eve or you create or credit God with what a glorious thing it is for you to be expectant and then have a child. But I know how many I've heard from. I know, and we've all, it's you that can, can come alongside and say, listen, you might not have this, but if you do, it's going to hit you like a brick wall. And there are going to be no explanations because her husband said she was even keeled and she did all these things. He said, I would even sit and marvel at how she just never stopped. And wonder how you did it all. When that thing hits you, gang, he said it just started four months ago and like cancer, it came and took her quickly. And and here's an issue I have too in the church world, the American church world. We've done this equating thing that what happens in the realm of the soul is equal to what happens in the realm of the Bible. That's not always the case. The Bible doesn't support that 100% of the time. There's a difference between your body and your soul. But I want to be careful about those things because I, I am praying for him and those kids because I've watched a thousand families during the first few weeks of that kind of loss. And then I've seen those families a year later and it just never leaves and it burdens and it bears down on you. So we're, we're going to pray for this family and uh, all of those associated with it. But you and I need to be reminded that there's a place for us to come in alongside our brother or sister and say, listen, you need to be aware of the reality. And, and this can happen to a strong believer. Well, pastor, that was Old Testament, but it was David. There was nobody more New Testament than David. I know that you and I have the blood that we look back to, but he was looking forward to it. I know we understand the power of Pentecost, but I'm going to show you he walked in it too. I know that we think of the risen Savior, but he was the type of the risen Savior. So you and I can be confident that even though this comes before the book of Matthew, that it is gospel. This is the power of God saying to you and I that in this life you and I will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Our king has overcome the world. Amen? He has, In one of these days, he's going to show us what that new world feels like and looks like. It's, um, it's just difficult. And if you lose hope, you have not lost the battle. It's not unusual to lose hope at times. But in the midst of fear, you need to intentionally remind yourself of his works. David's going back through. Now, as king, he had an advantage over lots of the other people. He could call the high priest or any of the other priests. He could say, come, bring the scroll of God's word and and read me. And they would go back to the books of Moses and they'd begin to read. And then they'd go into the book of Joshua and they'd begin to read. And he would read about those incredible miracles, how God delivered his people and how the sun stood still because Joshua said, in the mighty name of the King of glory. And you and I can have that kind of experience. But pastor, I'm not David. No, I'm not either. But God wants us to understand that we can get there. Now you reach a fork in the road when you come to this. And I know many of you work in the medical community and I've said a thousand times and I'll continue to say, thank God for where you are. Thank God for what you do and the access you have to bring to us medicine. And Sister Pam and I have a wonderful uh, practitioner, and we, I go every year to Morgantown because there's a fantastic dermatologist there. I recognized a few years ago, every time I read a description about the skin type and the hair color and complexion of those who are susceptible to skin cancer, I qualified in 11 out of 10 categories. 
So I went, and he said, <laughs> this was like 8 or 10, 10 years ago. And he said, we're going to remove some things. I'm like, oh. He said, then you're going to come back every year. So every year, I drive over there, and we do a scan. Now, that sound not an MRI. No, no, not where you go in, and you, you know, the tube, and they look inside. No, this is a head-to-toe scan of him and me and whoever else is in the room. And that's it. It's like the one time I'm unbuttoning my shirt and the woman says, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready for a scan. She said, no, no, he just looks at it. I said, oh, no, I do this every year. He looks at every spot. Have you ever seen those monkeys that look at the other monkey and they're picking little bugs out? <laughs> He's talking to me. He's a believer. He's originally from our area. He knows I travel internationally. So He's always asking me where I've been, what's going on. And while I'm answering, he's picking through what little bit of hair I have left. And I always think like I'm the monkey sitting there with almost no clothes on. And he's looking for little mites and whatever they look for. He's picking them off of me. We thank God for that. But listen, between the physical body and the spirit that Jesus Christ has saved, there's this huge area of gray. I think it kind of resides in the brain. It's gray. I think it resides in the heart. It's called the soul. And it's always trying to function in between these two, but it has an orientation towards the flesh, which is fallenness and sin and selfishness and greed. And those things are challenging. And they can uh, overwhelm us and take us into places where it's difficult to find our way out. Remember what he said in verse 3, my enemy has chased me. Now look here at verse 6. David says, I lift my hands to you in prayer. Now there are places in the Bible where it tells us to be still before the Lord. If you're reading with us in the Old Testament, I think it was in Jeremiah where he said, I'm going to sit quietly before the Lord. It might have been Lamentations. I'm going to sit quietly before the Lord and wait on him. And there's a place for that. But there's also a place for this. I'm going to tell you something. If you think the only style of worship is hands folded, mouth shut, and never moving or saying anything to God, you're being disobedient to the Lord. He has called us to both forms of worship. Don't you abandon your Pentecostal worship. Don't you give up on raising your hands in God's house. Don't you say, well, I'm so overwhelmed and discouraged and depressed. Sometimes you're so depressed, you've got to throw your hands up and say, God, I give up, but I worship you. I let go of everything else, but I'm holding on to you. God, I give up trying and I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to do it anymore because the more I struggle, the more discouraged I get. But I'm going to come into your... Now listen, you can't just say those things. And you can't just say them for two or three minutes. Well, pastor, you make it seem like you would never, you would never go to that place. No, I'm not telling you that any of us are above going to that place of darkness. But I... I do draw the line there. I, I, I just think that, that we're here to let Jesus win through us. And if he chooses to take my life, that's his business. But the other, I, I'm not doing anybody any good if I don't take a stand for life. Live. Live another day. Take the medicine. Find the treatment. Whatever you need so you can live another day and get breakthrough. Your healing might come tomorrow. Your deliverance might come next week. Hang in there. Find a way to breathe another day. Let God bring those things. Well, why? If God's going to heal me in three months, Pastor, why should I? Why didn't he just do it today? I don't know why God doesn't do what I want him to do when I want him to do it. But I think it has something to do with that, how much I want to be in control. I think he loves bringing me to that place where I have to say I'm not in control. I can't handle these 18,000 people following me. I can't handle homeschooling all my kids and having postpartum having another a newborn I've got four in school and one that's in diapers I, I just I, there are things I want to say I can't tell you how restrained I'm being because we as brothers and sisters owe each other we have a responsibility I am my brother's keeper and that's why sometimes I'm pinching some of you and saying listen are you sure are you going too far I had Pastor Asher in Pakistan last year and I said so help me if I find out when I get home from Pakistan, I find out you didn't take a few days off and spend with your family, I will never be back here. I won't send you another dime. You start now. A couple of days later, he sent me a picture of them at a resort. <laughs> so I'm with my wife and kids. I said, good. Sister Pam and I have told more than one pastor, have you had a sabbatical? Do you know what a sabbatical is? It's time for yours now. 
I'm watching one right now. Told him a few years ago, you got to do this. I know what's going to happen. He thinks he was, I know what it is to be that age and have what's happening to him. I know. I was 28 years old. I was a pastor of a growing church. We had gone from 75 to 250 plus. I was a district uh, presbyter. I ran the district school of the Bible. I, you, you name it, I was head of missions. I did it. It's the stupidest thing anybody ever let me do. Where were the adults that should have kicked me, literally kicked me in the rear end and said, something will break. Something is going to break. Get your act together and understand that saying yes to everything is not godly. Now again, I'm trying to be careful here. I'm not necess- I have no idea what happened in that pastor's life in California or his wife. Absolutely not. But what I am telling you this morning is I'm going to be diligent until Jesus takes me home to try to point out to you, and you pointed out to me, whenever we're on the edge. All right, here's the second thing. Look at verse 7. Come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me, or I will die. Boy, this isn't getting any better, is it? Number one, losing hope is not losing the battle. Number two, deepening depression is not the end of your story. Now, I'm using these cliches because that's what I wanted. A cliche isn't going to get you out of anything. But there's a truth here that your depression can get deeper before God brings your deliverance. And in that deep depression, you may only be able to go back to certain things Only a few of those things. Make sure that one of those things is that you have an experience, a rich experience with Jesus, so that when you don't know how or don't have the energy or the ability emotionally to pray for yourself, to spend time in prayer, that you've got something left in the well there. Make sure that when you're overwhelmed, that you've got strong believers around you. You may not want them when you want to be out run around, when you're wanting to be like hell Monday through Saturday, but when the fire falls, when everything's pressing against you, you're going to want some strong believer. I love it when somebody says to me, Pastor, I've been faithful at work for all these years. I've been secretly praying and just waiting, and now here they come, one after another. This one's happening, going through that. The other one's facing that, and they're coming to me at lunch break. They're coming to me in the afternoon and saying, Listen, I'm sorry. I made fun of you. You, I criticized you, but I need you to pray for me. My grandson's on heroin, and I don't know what to do. My wife's left me, and I don't know how to change. And in that moment, there's that strong believer. Listen, you and I have to have those people in our lives. You've got to. Who else are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to somebody in the professional world that says, listen, I'm sorry, prayer's fine, but it really doesn't help. Your depression deepening is not the end of the story. It's okay. Now listen, I'm going to throw something out there that the article didn't talk about. I don't know if they do at their church or not, but I'm going to add something that I don't see in many reports. I don't see in churches outside of those like ours. And I'm going to bring it to your attention again. What you're going through might be demonic. And there aren't too many people outside of Pentecost that will talk about that. My brother-in-law called me a couple of weeks ago and said, Hey, what are you doing? You know, Sister Pam and I spent two days with them down in a a state park in West Virginia a couple of weeks ago. Just met there and had two, well, a little more than a day and a half. Just wonderful time together. They passed her and we just had meals together, just the four of us. So he called me a couple of nights later. I don't know, Saturday night, Monday night. I think, well, he's going to say, what a great time we had. And that's how the conversation starts. We had a great time. It was fantastic. My brother-in-law is a friend to me. And uh, the two of them have been so good to Sister Pam and I. We laughed a few months ago, maybe while we were driving down. We were young evangelists. Uh, we had a truck. We say we lived out of the truck, but we did not live in the truck. We lived with everybody who would open their doors to us. And uh, Alan Fletcher were among them. And a revival in West Virginia one night, he was in the passenger seat that night in the service. And we drove down together. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, received his call to the ministry. Under me was my associate pastor. And so we've been, and the second thing in the phone call he says is, what are you doing this weekend? I'm like, well, stuff. You want to come and help me pray for somebody? No, I don't. 
Well, you don't understand. This guy is demon possessed. I mean, the real deal. He, this, 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 and this. It's, oh, yeah, that's, that's it. You're right. Well, I need you to help me. So, listen, I got my own demons up here. I don't need to come looking for demons. <laughs> well, why would I drive three hours to help you with your demons? That, that's your place down there. You, you can handle them. That's why God called you there. Please. I said, no. Well, what do I do? What? And he knew what to do. I'm, I, please don't take that. But he said, what, what do you think? And he explained some things to me. I said, yeah, you, you're gonna, you need to fast. You fast and make him fast. Make him fast. Now, that's me asking. He didn't say, yeah. Sometimes people come to me and they want me to pray with them. And I say, okay, let's fast. Well, why would I fast? Well, listen, why should I be more passionate about your deliverance than you are? Well, I don't want to fast. Well, maybe God doesn't want you delivered. Well, no, pastor, God's good. He'll give me everything I want. Oh, absolutely. But he's going to teach you something. Well, I can't. I've never done a fast. I get headaches. <laughs> Come on, Pentecostals. That's why he calls us to fast. So we can learn that our headache is better in a fast than having a soul ache and not knowing what to do about it. All right. Well, anyways. And he did... I, I talked to him a few days later, and he's sending me the text from the guy. And you can just see this progression. They prayed with him, and God, God did work. I want to tell you today that what you're going through may have a demonic element, a demonic aspect. It might be satanic. And if you have that case, you can go to the most highly regarded pastor or Ph.D. psychologist. And until somebody who's anointed and understands discernment, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, begins to work with you and pray with you, you you will not see victory because this thing is demonic. Paul understood that. He said, three times I went to God and said, God, this thing is demonic. And God said, listen, I understand it's demonic. My grace. I want you to see my grace. I want you to understand my grace. In my grace, there's going to be deliverance. Now, Paul wasn't saying, listen, God just decided to say, nah, nah, too bad. Stay, stay struggling with your demon. What he was saying was, God showed me what was happening. God gave me discernment and insight, and I'm here writing to you today because God brought me through it. All right, we're running out of time. Yes, the believer experiences depression in this life. It's not a sin. Depression is not a sin. To have depression, to be going through depression, to be depressed, to have a season that lasts for weeks or even months, or some would testify years, is not a sin. Hello. I don't know whoever thought it was, but I guess some people did, or maybe people outside the church think we in the church believe it. We don't. We believe that if David said, my depression's deepening, it's okay for us to say, our depression's deepening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. See, we need to understand what sin is and what sin's not. And what we need to know is what breakthrough and deliverance looks like and what breakthrough and deliverance does not look like. All right, well, anyways. Here's the case, though. It cannot be the end of your story. The deepening depression that you're going through cannot be the end of your story. Here's the final thing. Look at verse 8. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting you. Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I run to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. For the glory of your name, O Lord, preserve my life. Because of your faithfulness, bring me out of this distress. In your unfailing love, silence all my enemies and destroy all my foes. For I am your servant. Number one, losing hope is not losing the battle. Number two, deepening depression is not the end of your story. And number three, a firm footing is in your future. There's a firm footing coming. What did David say? And everything he was going through is he's descending into this despair and depression with no known way out. He begins to say, look at the Spirit of God. Here he comes. Let me tell you something, Pentecostals. We have something 
that we dare not let go of. It grieves me that in America, it grieves me that in Pentecostal churches, it grieves me that at Central Assembly, we have forgotten how wonderful, how important, how helpful, and how healing the Holy Spirit is. And not just the theme of the Holy Spirit or the theology of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't ascend to give us the Apostles' Creed. He didn't ascend to give us church buildings. He didn't ascend. The Bible nowhere says that he ascended to give us better theology or better doctrine. He didn't ascend to give us denominations or how to be right in what we believe. He ascended to give gifts unto men. That was the only purpose of the resurrection and the ascension. And because you and I sir, were so miserable and worthless, he had to save us so that he could give us those gifts. Otherwise, the giving would have been of no good, no value. But when he ascends, he gives gifts unto men. That's the answer to everything. And you can say, well, pastor, I prayed about it. I sought God. I wanted to have the Holy Spirit. I wanted to have the baptism and pray in tongues, but I didn't. Whoa, time out, time out, time out. Where does God say he's a respecter of persons? Where does he say he's different today than he was yesterday? Well, I prayed and I just couldn't get it. We heard somebody say that, somebody related to this situation. I sat right there at the end of the conference. I had a question. I didn't know this church was not a Pentecostal church. I'm talking about the one where this family ministered. I'd never heard of the guy. Here he'd written books. I didn't know. There was a question and answer time. There's only 30 of us there. I was hearing things that weren't adding up. I said, Pastor, how many people in your church do you, do you feel have, percentage-wise, how many people have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with a Pentecostal experience? He said, we estimate 20%. I thought, number one, I thought that was incredible because I, if you asked me, I wouldn't know how many of you. I know I want all of you to have that. And then it dawned on me. He starts telling the story, and I'm like, oh, you don't pastor a Pentecostal church, and you yourself are not. I prayed with them. Um, Sister Gentile, last Wednesday night after church, everybody else was out of the building, prayed right back there. She started telling me what was going on. I said, the Holy Spirit just, boom, said, ask her if she's had an encounter with me. I did. She's bawling. No, but that's what I want. So uh, that's what he wants too. Let's pray. Boom. You see, here's what a lot of people do. They begin by saying, I'll never speak in tongues in the church. I don't want to do that publicly. I'm not going to do that out. Something might happen. I'm at the grocery market, and, I might, and I'm not going to do that. I don't want to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and God send me into missions. I don't, I don't, I don't. And you tell God all the things you want, and God will say, let me show you all the things I won't do. See, we have this control issue. We have this issue of having to feel like we run it, we own it, we know how. And that's the opposite of what the baptism does. The Holy Spirit comes to tell you that Jesus Christ is in control. And if he chooses for you and I to go through a season of dark depression, we're going to go through it, but we're going to be okay because he's with us. If he chooses to let some tragedy happen or for you to get COVID or have to deal with bankruptcy or whatever, you're going to go through it and you're going to make it. Amen? Well, pastor, there might be a stigma. Listen, you can't control what other people do or think, but what you can control is how God is working in your life, and you and I can walk with him and let him do miracles in us and through us and say, God, I want you more than anything else. I don't want to be in control. I give up everything. I want you to do in me and through me whatever you want to, and I live by that, and if you say that to the Lord, I'm going to tell you something. You've heard all the missionaries say, oh, be careful if you pray that. Why are we telling people not to pray what the Bible tells them to pray? The chances of God calling you to be a missionary about one in 10 million. But pastor, that's always the chances I take. Now it happens to me every time. He wants you to be a great business owner. He wants you to be a wonderful nurse. He wants you to be a fantastic manager. He wants you to be a terrific secretary or office administrator. He wants you to be an awesome firefighter. He wants you to be that person on, in the equipment industry or the sales or whatever it is. He wants you there on his behalf. He's not going to try and send you most likely to the four winds of the earth, the four corners of the globe. He wants you to be surrendered right where you are so that he can do great and awesome things. I've got to close out here today. Now listen, this can be 
much more easily said than achieved. But look at David. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I run to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will. Teach me to do your will. Teach me to speak your will, to speak worshipfully, to speak encouragingly. Teach me, Lord, to pray in the Spirit, for you are my God. May your gracious Spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. Pentecostal worship is a medicine for our souls. The firmness can only come from the Holy Spirit. I respect those of you who are believers that do not believe Pentecost this way. You do not believe in the work of the Holy Spirit like we do. You don't have that experience. You don't want it. I respect you. You can have whatever you want. You can go as far as with God as you want to go. But here's what I'm telling you. It's the Holy Spirit that provides the firmness when everything else is gone. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to be in our homes shortly, huddled together as small groups or families. I've been very careful about saying too much over the last few years. But things are going to become so increasingly stressful and oppressive that you're going to find it pleasurable to be able to be with two or three other believers. And in those homes, in those prayer times, we're going to be crying out to God, please deliver us from what we're seeing happen. Please help us. If you haven't read of this before, you start in the book of Jeremiah and read through and say, God, please don't let it happen here. He said to Israel, I'm going to make you a witness to the other nations that when they sin against me, this is what happens. I heard it years ago in ministry. Oh, God, he won't judge America. He loves America. We send Bibles and missionaries all over the world. You tell me. You tell me what's coming. Mm -hmm. and believers are going to fall away. Hold on, gang. Hold on to Jesus Christ, not to Central, not to Doug. You hold on to Jesus Christ. If your doctor has prescribed medicine with you for whatever, for your broken body or your broken soul, then you take the medicine as prescribed. You don't give the medicine to the dog or the daughter. You take your medicine. You don't take half of it because you're afraid you might not have enough next year. You take the medicine. If you can't afford it, tell your doctor, hello, we don't even have TV, and I've seen those commercials. Come on. Gang, this is time for us to live another day so that Jesus can work in us. Amen. I deliver my heart to you today. Stand with me, please. We gotta, we've got to know that even in darkness, we can move out. If you're here today and you're not in darkness, hallelujah. If you don't feel the oppression of the world we live in and you're not experiencing depression, be, be thrilled. And I'm sure that you know somebody who is. Somebody who's just overwhelmed. Listen, be a friend to them. Sometimes there's nothing we can say, but just hold them. Weep with them. Encourage them. Listen, there are better days ahead. Have you talked to your doctor? Is there somebody else that can help you? I'm sorry, I'm fighting for every life. I, I don't have this thing of, well, there was nothing that could be done when it comes to uh, the soul or the spirit. There's always, I thought we always said as long as there's breath in your body. And when it's a pastor or a pastor's wife, and I've done this a number of times, it grieves us, just as it would in your profession or your, your job. Sister Pam and I have been through a thousand things. There's probably another thousand that we'll go through. You've been through things. But God is faithful. Hold on. Hold on. We've got people here who had COVID, people who've lost loved ones to COVID, people who had the vaccine then got COVID. And listen, I don't have explanations for all that. We're just holding on. Amen. Some of you have lost kids along the journey of life. I talked to somebody here the other day. It's been a number of years. Doesn't change it.
whatever you're facing, you're facing it not only with Jesus, but in the Spirit of God. Bow your hearts with me. Lord, today I'm so burdened for my brothers and sisters. If pastors and pastors' wives are being pushed to the breaking point, then I know people across this congregation and folks watching me online are being pushed to the breaking point. We have neighbor against neighbor, people who are mask and anti-mask, vaccine and anti-vaccine, medicine and anti-medicine, and supplements and anti Lord, help us not to pick a cause, but to pick the Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to open this altar for just a moment or two this morning. We don't, we're early, but I know that you have things planned in your day. But I want to open this not to people who are facing some situation or depression or overwhelmed darkness. No, I just want to open it up to anybody that's, that would say, Jesus, I want to be standing on a firm foundation. I want to be standing on a firm footing. No matter what I've been through or what I might go through, I want to be standing on a firm footing. You've promised that. That's your promise. And you said that you will not break any of your promises. That's not a promise to one person or some special religious people. That's your promise to every son and daughter that we would stand on a firm footing in you. And I want to stand on that. I recognize, just like Pastor, I'm, I feel the storms that are gathering around us. People who are unbelievers are scared to death. The fires are going to overtake them, or the hurricanes are going to drown them. They're scared to death. The climate's falling apart. As believers, we understand these are the messages, the signs of the coming of Jesus, but it's still hard. And in all of this, we don't want to lose our minds. Jesus said in our patience, we possess our psyche. In our, in our patience, we hold it. We, we own it. It may be beat up at times. It may be bruised and battered, but it's going to remain because in patience, the Holy Spirit comes and brings soothing balm and ointment to heal us. If you'd say, Lord, I want to I want to stand on a firm footing. I want to pray with you this morning. I want you to slip out of where you are and just stand all across this front. Just I want, No matter what, I don't want to know your story. You're not going to know mine. But you just going to say, no matter what I go through, I want to be standing on a firm footing. As I pray, I want you to slip out of where you are and just stand in this front. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to lay hands on you. just going to pray. Lord Jesus, today as we come into this altar to stand, we come here to stand, Lord. We want to be on a firm footing, no matter what we face. You might be the healthiest person in here. You might be the emo most emotionally stable, but you're just saying to God today, I want to stand on a firm footing, no matter what. Lord, you, Sister Linda, and the gifts today, and she's just gone through treatment after treatment, but to come in here and just be Pentecostal, man, that blessed me. That just encouraged me. That reminded me that in the fight, we don't lose our faith. Early this week, there was a picture of a young Marine, 23 years old, holding a baby. It was one of the pictures. I know there were several but she was cradling that baby. She was 23 years old, the Marine, highly honored within the Marine Corps, loved her job, and that's what she wrote under the picture. The military, one branch, I don't know that it was the Marines, but one branch even was using that picture to highlight what it meant to serve your country. And she had that Afghani baby holding that baby, and she said on her, when she posted, she said, I love my job. She was one of the 13 killed the other day. It's two days later. That family's got a burden today. We have families here that their kids or grandkids are in the Marine Corps. Father, today I'm praying for my brothers and sisters. This darkness that we live in, Lord, it can be oppressive. 
It can be like a pit at times, and it can pull us down. But we're reminded in your word that even King David felt that constant battle for a season in his life, that that darkness and depression was deepening. And Lord, he wasn't sure what to do or where to run, how to even turn around. But God, in the midst of all of that, he was reminded that the Holy Spirit was available to him. He was reminded that the anointing breaks the yoke. He was reminded that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will lift us up, heal our psyche, cause us to live another day so that we can look forward to worshiping the King of glory so that we are ready for his return, so that we're focused on others and not ourselves. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of the living God. Come and encourage us today. Come and lift us up out of darkness. We rebuke demon spirits in the mighty name of Jesus. We rebuke entanglements with darkness. We rebuke curses and spells. We rebuke spirits of depression and death in Jesus' name. Every suicidal spirit, go. Get out. Never return in the mighty name of Jesus. I speak to you today, child of God. I speak to a son or a daughter of the King Jesus Christ. And I say to you, you will live and not die. You will prosper spiritually. And your soul will be in health and prosper. Your soul, your psyche. God will bless you in your psyche and it will be more worth more than Bitcoin or gold. It will be worth more than silver or power or fame or followers or likes because he's caused you to prosper in your psyche. Come on, come on. Let's enter in for just a moment prophetically. Come on, let's go in prophetically. Sister Pam, as, as you're just giving us background worship, let's go in prophetically. Jesus, come on, if you're spirit-filled, it's okay. It's, this, is a, this is a time of private worship publicly, and it's okay. Now, if you've not had a Pentecostal experience, you've not experienced it, don't tell God what you're not going to do. Don't tell God what you won't let him have. You say to the Lord, fill me. Fill me until I overflow. You fill me until the words flow like a river. You fill me until I can't stop. If my family goes home and I'm still here at 2 o'clock today, you fill me because there's darkness every evening. Come on, you hear me? Let it pull you in. Let it pull you in. Well, Pastor, I can't do that. You're not doing it. But you got to let that first syllable go. Come on, give it unction. Give it voice. You wouldn't believe the places I've prayed over in downtown Cumberland. You wouldn't believe the prophetic things I've said. Sometimes it's just tongues to this business or that business. Sometimes it's just praying in the spirit over the walking bridge. Chaplain Paul says, others of you, you do the same thing. Hallelujah. I don't know what we're doing. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't have to see demons fall like lightning. I don't have to see any of it. All I know is I'm being obedient. I'm letting Jesus move in me and through me. It's the Holy Spirit that brings firmness to my feet. Hallelujah. Don't you let go of your Pentecostal experience. Stir up the gifts that are in you. Come on, stir up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up in Jesus. Somebody here today, you feel like you cannot be forgiven. You feel like you've broken every sin there is in the Bible and half the unpardonable sins. That There's no way you can be forgiven. You're just doing your best to come to church once in a while. But I say to you today, prophetically, God has heard your cry. And if you want to continue to live in your misery, he'll let you. But he said to you, you are forgiven. It is over. The blood has washed it clean. Come on, let go of it today. Let go of that unforgiveness in your own heart. You don't have to be loud like I am, and I have a microphone too, but just right there where you are, just let it begin to be a, a flow, a smooth flow of worship to the King. Well, pastor, how's it worship if I don't know what I'm saying? It's worship because it's spirit. And the spirit knows what to pray for. We don't. The spirit knows what to say. He says he's the king. 
and he's worthy. He's the Lord and he's the healer. The Holy Spirit says he's the soon coming one. He's the resurrection and the deliverance. He's the prosperity and the blessing. The Holy Spirit says he's your redeemer and he's your lover. The Holy Spirit says he's making a place for you. He's building a place for you. The Holy Spirit says the King is worthy of your love. The King is worthy of your devotion. But you and I declare something to the Lord today. I'm going to lead you in this and then I want you to declare it as well. Lord Jesus, you are my provider. I receive from you the Holy Spirit who will give me a firm footing in all darkness, in all depression, in all despair. I trust you today and every day. I will walk with you through deep waters until Jesus returns. Yes. Father, you've heard our commitment this morning. You've heard the prayers of my brothers and sisters and the worship. We pray for this family that I referenced today. Father, you know that when I heard it, when I saw the headline, my heart fell. I understand some of what she came up against. God, my heart breaks for people who get to the very edge and become overwhelmed. We don't have every answer, even in Pentecost, but we have the Holy Spirit. Every believer has access to your precious spirit, Lord Jesus. And today we remind ourselves of how grateful we are that you ascended to give gifts to us. And we trust those. We don't even trust ourselves for our own hearts are deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know them? Our own heart can lead us astray, can rise up and try and kill us. But Lord, you have spoken life to us and we're going to live today so that we can be delivered tomorrow. We're going to live another day so that we can find breakthrough and healing in your perfect time. Thank you for our medical community. Thank you. Lord, we have many who are also believers, many who are spirit-filled believers who love your word, know that they're called to that place and they serve wonderfully and professionally. Father, forgive me. You know I struggle when somebody who's an unbeliever begins to tell the church that there are limits to what our faith can know or understand about the mind. That there are limits to what you can do. You are the God of no limits. Help us when we go through the darkness. Help us when a family member is struggling to be encouraging, supportive, and loving. Help us to hold them and hug them. To, to say to them, the Lord loves you and I love you. To not try to teach them, coach them, or correct them. But to simply love them. To pray with them and bless them. To speak good and not harm. Help us, Lord. Help us. The Lord is doing beautiful things at this altar today. I love you, church. I, I just love the way you respond to these kinds of messages. You know that it's hard for me, but I knew that this is where God wants us to go today. Thanks to Sister Pam. This worship has been encouraging. Listen, Wednesday night there's meals in the gym if you're interested. Next Sunday is our picnic, so we'll only preach three and a half minutes. Sister Pam will only lead one minute of worship and we'll go right to the pavilion. We'll be there at 1010. As soon as the service is over, we'll go up there and we'll have a great time. If you've never been up there, please stay. If you're new to the church, it's just fellowship, nothing else, no heavy lifting. May the Lord bless you today and every day. May he remind you that he is your firm footing. He's the floor. No matter what you're in, no matter how dark, he's the floor. And he's a covering over you. You can cry out to him. Now listen, sometimes it might take an hour. I'm sorry, it does. Sometimes it might only take a minute. May the Lord bless you to break through. May the Lord hold you until you see it. May he prosper you in your soul until you feel it. May he put his angels around about you today and every day and until Jesus comes. I love you, church. Those of you who are staying for the um, meeting,
meeting with me about greeters. Um, let's just meet right down here. And there was another thing I need to tell you today, but I didn't do it and I forgot and I'll do it later. God bless you.